Today, I'm gonna to show you how to make your cinematic sequences cleaner and easier to watch. Roll the intro. Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here, hi, my name is Steven. I make videos about making videos. If you wanna learn how to make videos for your business or your personal brand, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. And also make sure you smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm, because today I'm gonna to show you how to make cleaner cinematic sequences. I'll jump into my main points in a second, but I first want to tell you what a cinematic sequence is if you're not familiar. You've definitely seen them. Uh, YouTubers like Peter McKinnon, Chris Howe, I do them a lot, a lot. They're, they're a very popular way to transition from one scene into another, or just like at the high point of a video. In its simplest form, it's like a, a mini music video. It's normally footage on top of music with some sound effects. There are tons of videos already on how to make them, and there, there are a lot of repeated tips, like uh, shooting in 60 frames a second and then having your timeline in 24, or uh, putting black bars or cine bars on the top and bottom of the shot. I think those are all done to death. I mean, th they're good tips to follow. I follow that that 60 frames rule like almost every cinematic sequence I shoot. But I've come up with some things that maybe not everyone thinks about when they're making a cinematic sequence. Just, just these little things that could really improve your video. So to start, I wanna look at an example of a not smooth cinematic sequence. And then we're gonna look at a smooth one. We're gonna look at some of the things I did to make that one a whole lot better. You're grabbing the mac and cheese door. That was cool, but close up on the water. Okay. Yeah. All right, that wasn't smooth. I didn't like that one. Now let's go ahead and look at a cinematic sequence I'm actually proud of. That one, uh, the coloring was a lot more consistent, kind of had a, a more blue vibe. There's consistent motion in several of the different shots. You're, you're seeing things happen on the beat. So that's what the video is about today. We're gonna look at how to go from that bad example to that good example. Just some of the things I did in that intro to make it um, what I think is good enough to use in every video. Okay, I've stalled enough. Let's let's actually get into these tips right now. One thing I did for the intro was I more or less planned ahead. I, this intro isn't the best example of planning ahead, but I will go into that. Planning ahead, I mean choosing the music before you shoot. Shooting for the music is super, super important. The music is, for me, one of my favorite tools for making the viewer feel a certain way. So it's super important that my music matches the tone of the video or what I want the viewer to feel while they're watching my video. That's one thing I really like about Disney movies is they are really good at scoring. They really take advantage of music and just create this feeling that makes you wanna go watch another Disney movie. Have you guys seen the new Aladdin? The music in that movie is just, come on. All right, well, I guess we're not gonna have the, the small panel light, oh well. The song I used for my intro is Focus on Myself by Gloria Tells, and I downloaded the instrumental version from Epidemic Sound. I'll just listen to music on Epidemic, and if it makes me feel a certain way, I'll add it to a certain playlist. And one playlist in particular, I write a comment for every song that goes in that playlist. One nice thing about Epidemic Sound is you can leave comments on things, like your own personal comments, not public comments like YouTube. But what I do is, if a song makes me feel a certain way, I will put it in the playlist, I'll write down the key that the song is in, and then I'll write down what it's making me feel or what it makes me think of. Then when I shoot a vlog or something and I don't really have time to prepare, or if I am preparing ahead of time and I, I think this is what I want, then I can go to that playlist and do an in-page search for what I'm looking for, uh, what kind of feeling I want, put that in the video and then shoot for it. The reason I put down the key of the music is uh, it's more of a, a personal thing. I have perfect pitch and for me, each key has a different feeling. This is more getting into music theory, but trust me, this makes sense. A song that is in F sharp minor, like No Money by Galantis, feels totally different from a song that's in C minor, like um, 
Rolling in the Deep by Adele. And now, of course, those are different genres, like, but you know, like even, even within the same genre, there's still, it feels totally different. But I think everyone subconsciously is affected by what key a song is in. Everyone knows that generally major keys are more happy normally than minor keys, but I think within that, keys have totally different feelings. And that's just something I noticed. So I put down the key, and if, and, and if I feel like while I'm preparing for a video, like uh, this feels like an F sharp minor uh, video, then I'll look for a song that's an F sharp minor and then play it and I don't know, that's just how my brain works. The next thing I did in the intro was I used motion graphics templates and assets, specifically the ones from Peter McKinnon. You don't just have to use footage in your cinematic sequences. I feel like that's one thing I notice um, is that, that people just don't experiment with non-video footage. You can put effects over your video, like the, the text and the backgrounds or the textures, I guess, in my intro or uh, lens flares. So that's a huge one. Lots of people love to use lens flares and the stuff like that, that if used properly can really make your cinematic sequences stand out. Now with great power comes great responsibility. Don't use like chromatic aberrations and distortion just because you can and you know it's this new fancy trick and you want to try it. They, they are okay used in moderation or if the if the video calls for it if you're doing just like a really chill you know relaxing music sequence of some guy in the sunset walking up to a balcony don't put some distortion on that that doesn't make any sense you know but in something like my intro that's supposed to be high energy and really get you hyped up for the video that you're about to watch that's a good that's a good time to use that kind of stuff to get the viewer really revved up. Another trick I used in my intro was consistent motion. If you pay attention, you'll notice the motion between several of the different shots is the same. Let's actually take a look at that right now. First, you have that shot of the bus that's moving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And then the next shot, you have the, I think that's the the Metro headquarters at LA Union Station, uh, whatever. Uh, it's moving from the left to the right of the screen. That is just pleasing to the eye. It's, it's consistency. I did a few other things in my intro, like transitions. I did a little bit of speed ramping. If you don't know what either of those are, well, transitions is one way of getting uh, from one shot to another. It can be as simple as a cut, or what I did in my intro was I actually had a lens distortion that I animated to be like full distortion going down to no distortion. And then if you put a cut between two clips that are kind of distorted all the way at the middle, you can barely tell there's a transition. I saw this in one of Matt Como's cinematic videos and I was like, oh, I have to use that. I have to do that. <laughs> so, and then speed ramping is the same thing as that animation of the distortion where it's like peak distortion in the middle, but it's with speed. Speed ramping is changing the speed of a clip while it's playing. So like you have one clip, I think the bus, shot i think that one speeds up and then it cuts to the shot of metro headquarters it gets faster and then it cuts if you get it fast enough oftentimes the viewer won't be able to tell there's a cut there just because it's moving so fast that one that one's pretty common a lot of people do speed ramping and it is very helpful i'll be honest i don't do it that much um just because a lot of my sequences don't call for it and it's kind of annoying uh, in Premiere, at least my Premiere, it's a bit annoying having to do that because for whatever reason, my, when, it, when you put a keyframe down to speed ramp and you try and grab one of the things to move it, it grabs the other one, like like the one that you didn't select, and then it moves that one. Um, I don't know, this, this isn't Twitter. I shouldn't be complaining about Premiere here. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, speed ramping's great. You should do speed ramping, black bars, shooting 60, and then all the, all the big tips I hit earlier. If you have any other cinematic tips, let me know down below in the comments. That would be really helpful. I want to thank you for watching this video. If you wouldn't mind hitting that like button down below and subscribing to get more videos just like this one, that would be great for you and for me. And if you're not done here, go ahead and check out this video. I don't know what video this is going to be yet, but uh, it's an absolute banger. So you should you should check it out totally definitely